This lecture covers the primary artifacts of the Scrum project, the components which are the lifeblood of an Agile project. We've seen previously this picture, which shows the general approach of an Agile project, well, specifically a Scrum project, it shows the different roles and deliverables um, that are created during a Scrum project. And so when we talk about the artifacts that are created or used in the Scrum framework, we're focusing primarily on the components that drive the delivery. That's the project backlog, which is made up of features and stories. Here's a snapshot from a backlog from Azure DevOps. The items in this backlog include a variety of stories, tasks, epics, and features. Important aspects of a backlog include priority as well as the relative effort required. Priority is what helps to define what is included in a particular sprint, and relative effort is used to define what can be realistically accomplished in an iteration. As we'll see in a later lecture, when we focus on planning projects and estimating effort, it's important to ensure that the highest priority items are well defined so they can be addressed in the next two to three sprints. Epics, stories, or features that occur after this can remain a bit vaguer until they become higher priority. The point here is we don't want to waste time documenting or describing features which are likely to change as the project goes on and our understanding of a particular feature gets more crisp. Instead, we'll put them in the list as placeholders and when they move closer to the top of the list, we'll have a better idea of how to describe them later. One important aspect of a backlog is that it is a live list. The product owner can add, remove, and update items on them constantly. Though once an item is assigned to an active sprint, the item moves off the backlog and now owned by the team. While product backlogs contain stories, epics, and features, which we'll discuss in detail in just a minute, this overarching list can also include functional and non-functional requirements. Functional requirements refer to aspects of the system which the system must perform. For instance, there can be functional requirements for how business process happens or the steps in a particular calculation. They're meant to capture the behavior of the system. Non-functional requirements, also called quality attributes, are those standards that are used to judge the operation of the system. For instance, how quickly a page loads or the security design constraints. Both are very important and should be described with equal rigor and detail. A product backlog may also contain items associated with technical upgrades or tasks that are needed to keep the system running well. This list may also include significant bug fixes or tasks related to fixing items that are discovered after the system is delivered. Some projects include different backlogs of varying scopes. The product backlog should be the master list of items that the team should be focused on. A release backlog may be helpful to subset the items in the product backlog into a list of items that will be targeted for a particular release or system version. Some teams even keep a sprint backlog. This is the list of items that will be addressed in the current or upcoming sprint. The implementation or usage of these different backlogs may or may not be possible given the tools that your organization is leveraging. You may need to be creative, use tags or some other field to create artificial views to simulate backlogs. The primary method of capturing requirements in an Agile project is through the use of user stories. Stories capture the intent of how end users will engage with the system, the motivation, and the intended outcomes. Multiple stories may be required to complete a particular feature, and epics capture major themes in the system and are described by a collection of user stories. And tasks are the specific work items that are required in order to realize a user story. In this next section, we'll talk in detail about what is a user story, how to write good user stories, and to make sure that they are sized appropriately. Look at several examples of great user stories. In software development and project management, a user story is an informal, natural language description of one or more features of a software system. A user story is a tool used in agile software development to capture a description of a software feature from an end user perspective. A user story describes the type of user, what they want, and why. A user story also helps 
to create a simplified description of a requirement. User stories are often recorded on index cards, post-it notes, or in a project management software. Depending upon the project, user stories may be written by various stakeholders, such as clients, users, managers, or the development team members. Requirements always change as teams and customers learn more about the system as the project progresses. It's not exactly realistic to expect project teams to work off the static requirements list and then deliver functionality, um, or functional software anyway, months later. With user stories and this approach, we can replace big upfront design with a just enough approach. User stories reduce the time spent on writing exhaustive documentation by explaining customer-centric conversations. Consequently, user stories allow teams to deliver quality software more quickly, which is what customers prefer. There are quite a few benefits for adopting the user story approach in agile development. For instance, the simple and consistent format saves time when we're capturing and prioritizing requirements while remaining versatile enough to be able to be used on large and small features alike. We can keep expressing ourselves and expressing business value by delivering a product that the client really needs. We can avoid in introducing too much detail early that would prevent design options and inappropriately lock developers into one solution. We can avoid the appearance of false completeness and clarity. We can get to small enough chunks that invite negotiation and movement in our backlog or task list. And we can leave the technical functions to the architects, developers, testers, etc. So what is a user story? A user story is a lightweight method for quickly capturing the who, what, and why of a product requirement. In simple terms, user stories are stated ideas of requirements that express what the users need. User stories are brief, with each element containing fewer than, say, 10 or 15 words each. User stories are to-do lists in a way that help you determine the steps along the project's path. They can help to ensure that your process as well as the resulting product will meet your requirements. User stories are defined incrementally in, in basically three stages. Uh, a brief description of what's needed, the conversations that happen during the backlog grooming and iteration planning to solidify the details, and tests to confirm that the stories has been satisfactory completed. These are known as the three C's, card, conversation, and confirmation. We'll talk more about this later on in, the, um, in this lecture. So what makes a good user story? The acronym INVEST helps to re remember a widely accepted set of criteria, even a checklist, to assess the quality of a user story. If the story fails to meet one of these, re these requirements, the team may want to reword it or consider a rewrite, which then can translate into tearing up the old story card and writing a new one. A good user story should be independent. It should be self-contained in a way that allows, in, allows it to be released without depending upon another story. It should be negotiable. It should only capture the essence of the user's need. Leave room for some conversation. User story should not be written like a contract. It should be valuable in that it draws out and delivers value to the end user. It should be estimable, therefore, 
for, in other words, user stories should be able to be estimated so that we can properly prioritize and fit the work into our delivery plan or sprint. It should be small. Um, a user story is a small chunk of work that allows it to be completed in about three to four days. Any more than that, and we should be thinking about breaking our user story into smaller components. And it should be testable. A user story has to be confirmed by pre-written acceptance criteria so that we can ensure that we are delivering value at um, both with the implementation of the story and to ensure that the story has been completely understood and implemented. User stories are to be written in everyday language and describe a very specific goal, the what, as it were, from the perspective of an individual, the who, along with the reason that is the why, he or she wants this particular um, feature or capability. In software development, the goal is often a new product feature. The individual is some type of end user, and the reason is the benefit that the user sees in the targeted, targeted product feature. When we talk about the essential elements, we're really looking for a role, and the role should be an actual human being who interacts with the system. We need to be as specific as possible, and keep in mind that the development team is not a user. We need an action. That is, the behavior of the system should be written um, in such a way that it describes the action. Usually, it's unique for each user story. The system is implied and doesn't get written into the story. And we want to make sure that we're using active voice, not passive voice. From a benefits perspective, the, the outcome or the value of this particular feature should be a real world result that's um, not functional or external to the system. So in other words, we're not looking for user stories that give us technical requirements that I want to be able to um, add something to my shopping cart and check out within four seconds. That's not a great user story. And so while many of the user stories share a similar benefit statement, and we'll talk about this in a later lecture. The benefit may be for other users or customers, just not part of the story. That's still okay. Let's take a brief example into a user story. We're gonna start by setting up the scenario. In our scenario, we're asked essentially to build a better Facebook. We, we defined our vision statement to be a better social media platform. And as it states here, we want to focus on building um, a social media platform that's free of ads and unwanted content. It's supported by users and it's meant for families and communities. So if we try to envision what this might look like, we start by thinking about who our stakeholders are and how they'll interact with the system. In this particular case, I've gathered just a few examples of user stories from both the member and the moderator perspective. I've listed them out here in a table because it was convenient to, to capture them in Excel rather than on cards or on, on post-it notes. But as a larger team, it's often helpful to start on something low tech that can be moved around and and um, and gives everyone the opportunity to participate. The examples here show that we're being specific enough to help create a sense of the kinds of things that can be done in the application. 
but also not so specific that we can't negotiate what else could be on the list. We got stories that span multiple actions and have vastly differing scopes. For instance, the user story, I want to upload photos to share with groups and friends. Yes, we can agree that the site should allow for uploading photos, but we can question if this means that we need a mobile application or a web application. And we can also negotiate on what it means to share with groups and friends. We can easily think of specific actors or members to make it more personal, like Shreya. Shreya here is a fictional working mom with two, um, with rather twin school age girls who are involved in sports. And so when we don't have a specific customer like Joe in accounting um, to identify as our actor, it can be helpful to think in terms of personas to help develop our stories so we can make a, a deeper connection. In this case, just by putting a picture of Shreya and her daughters on the screen, you automatically start to connect with her. You start to feel like she's really someone who um, you're building an application for. And so if we look at um, and give Shreya a backstory, we can see some examples of how Shreya as a mom and member of, uh, of the parents of the rugby team community, we can uh, have much more natural stories and they often lead to much more richer and meaningful situations. The motivations become a lot clearer and the products become more user focused as we've, we're all invested in delivering for uh, Shreya. User stories are a useful way to build a better product backlog. Uh, that is kind of our task list and one that's very user centric and describes the software requirements in a practical and actionable way. But the stories themselves don't reveal the whole picture. Um, and they, they can't, um, really tie together the whole journey that the user goes through from the moment they load the app till the time they reach their final goal. In this case, a user story map can help us to arrange user stories into a manageable model for the plan um, to help understand and organize the functionality of the system um, systematically, really. By manipulating the structure of the map, we can identify holes and admissions in the, in the the overall design, the backlog, and then interlay, interlaying the user stories in a meaningful structure helps us to plan holistic releases that effectively deliver value to users and businesses on every release. The user story map allows us to create a second dimension to the backlog, and it can give us a few um, uh, a few more advantages. For instance, it allows us to see the picture of our backlog. It gives us a better tool for making decisions about grooming and prioritizing the backlog. That is removing stories, adding more, that kind of thing. It helps promote um, uh, brainstorming and kind of a collective approach to generating the user stories. It, it encourages an iterative development approach where our early deliveries validate the architecture and solution. It's a great traditional um, kind of, it's a great rather alternative to a traditional um, project plan. And it's, it provides a useful model for discussing and managing the scope. Finally, it really allows us to visualize dimensional planning and real options for our product and our project. A lot of the different software products that you may use to manage your backlog will have something similar and they'll use 
Unfortunately, everyone uses different vocabulary to describe what this looks like. They may, they may um, uh, uh, call out epics and sprints. They may call out tasks. They may call out um, releases, these kinds of things. So you'll have to be careful about the product that you're using and, and how the different vocabulary um, manifests itself. But the approach itself is simply uh, story mapping, that is, is a top-down approach of requirement gathering, and it's sometimes represented as a tree. So story mapping starts from user activities, and these user activities are around achieving particular goals, complete a user activity, they need to perform associated tasks. These tasks can be transformed into epics and stories for software development. Typically, user story map consists of something like three, four, five levels, um, user activities, tasks, and stories. And for enterprise applications, maybe a fourth level may be appropriate to include um, epics as well as user stories. At the end of the day, again, we kind of, we want to think about from the largest, most, um, most encompassing set of activities down to a specific um, task and how I will complete that task is what we're really trying to gather. And then we can use our backlog. One of the reasons we do this in, in a modular format like um, cards, uh, like uh, note cards or post-it notes, or, or even a system that has this like such, is so it's real easy then to move these particular aspects around. And we can kind of stack them up or put them um, in the we can put them into new categories or new parts of the tree without having to um, undo an entire project plan and all the dependencies that come with it. We often think of user story maps with several levels. Epics are at the top of the heap because they encompass large swaths of features and incorporate multiple user stories which further define the requirements of a particular epic. User stories should be scoped small enough for the team to complete in a single iteration. And finally, we can get very granular with use cases. Use cases, as we'll see, focus on the nitty gritty of the user story. They describe the specific interactions between the particular actors or end users and the system. They are meant to capture the steps that a business process executes and how the system supports these steps. Use cases can clarify how users are going uh, to come to realization. For instance, when the mapping from a user story to use case includes a data flow or a process flow diagram, this can help to communicate the complexities that aren't clear in the user stories as they're written, which is really kind of what we want because user stories should be written in a way that helps us communicate with non-technical folks as well as with our team. Use cases also highlight the expected process flow along with the exceptional cases. Thinking about how users might end up in an error state will help to ensure the design is robust before even starting to write a line of code. Use cases can be represented either in diagram or in text. When they're represented in a diagram, like the one on the left here, the stick people represent actors, the ovals show um, um, processes or system processes with the square box um, around these things uh, focusing on the system itself. This is a um, kind of a common, this is common uh, notation defined by um, a standard called the Unified Modeling Language. And we've looked at a few examples in some of the planning and design aspects, and we may look at more going forward, but it, aside from being, there's a few um, examples in UML that are that are really valuable and easy to, to kind of comprehend. There's some others that, that really uh, add unnecessary complexity in language, give language to our diagrams. That, um, that just make it difficult to communicate. They aren't quite as intuitive and, um, and they're not widely in use um, much anymore. 
the the uh, the lines again in this picture kind of show the interaction. So when we see a trader and um, uh, a trading database, those show kind of the interactions and the the actions that they take in terms of the analyst will select the stock from the work, trader workstation. Oftentimes, it can also be helpful to capture key aspects of the use case, such as shown in the middle. And the example in the middle gives us a lot more detail than, than the overall picture. And while we can get a sense of the different interactions in the picture, the, the text in the middle column calls out several different um, uh, pieces of data about a use case that really kind of help us to make it come alive. So for instance, we, we can title our, our use case. We can just define exactly who the actor is or the person interacting with our system. We can um, specify what, um, what's the precondition or what's the, what's the uh, state which the, which the system is in before the use case can even get started. We can also talk about um, the trigger or the event that starts it. So how does this um, particular use case um, get, get moving? What is, the, what is the starting point? We can talk about um, you know, uh, a minimal guarantee. So in other words, if there's something that um, uh, in, in this particular case, we called out that the actor will be given a notification of success or failure, regardless of whether we succeeded or failed. Um, so that becomes a minimum guarantee. And then we can talk about what happens in the successful case. When we tell the actor or the, the person interacting with our system what, what for sure happens if it finished successfully, we can talk about what we guarantee in that case. We can also um, walk through, and this is kind of very helpful, is what is that main path or the, what we like to call the happy path? What is the, if everything goes right and nothing goes wrong, what does that look like? And what does that mean from a good outcome? Now that doesn't mean that, that um, we haven't, that the, um, uh, this is the most likely path through the, through the, um, through the business process or through the process. And then we can have extensions for, in other words, for those cases that don't go through the most common path, maybe there's some exceptions that happen that we need to deal with. For instance, um, trying to upload the device, what happens if the network um, uh, dies while we're trying to upload the, our picture? Or what happens if um, uh, for some reason the user decides to cancel the, the upload of the picture while we're still trying to uh, package it and upload it to our site? Those are things that may happen in exceptional cases, and we can call those out as well in, um, in this diagram, or rather in this, uh, in this text. And on the very far right, I've shown an example just to remind you that we can also use um, flowcharts to help um, uh, describe this use case. Sometimes all three of these things together uh, in our functional specification can be really handy to say, well, here's what it looks like and where the interactions happen. Here's some details about how that about how that comes to be. And now let me show you a, um, a the the flow chart that we think of. Oftentimes, having a flow chart like this, or using um, another UML diagram uh, um, option like an activity uh, um, an activity diagram or a sequence diagram, which has swim lanes. In other words. It gives us ideas of, of who's responsible for each action. Can be helpful to, um, to make all of this kind of come together. So we understand on the left from the highest level what the interactions between the user and the system are. We understand kind of the how does this get started with the text. And then we have finally some kind of activity or flow diagram that, that really brings um, these complex business uh, uh, business cases to life. So in our writing scenarios, it's often helpful to not just show the most likely set of steps, 
which we call the happy path, but also the other exceptional cases. And we should be thinking about what else can go wrong to ensure these situations are also accounted for. While this level of difficulty, or level, sorry, level of detail is commonly found in projects where detailed planning happens before execution, um, these artifacts can still be helpful. Um, the use cases, the flow charts, and the the um, the use the use case uh, details can be um, can be really helpful, especially when we're talking about very complex business processes, um, regardless of, of whether we're using more of a waterfall approach or more of a, uh, a, um, um, an agile approach. And so while we've already covered the key attributes of good user stories, notice the invest kind of approach, good use cases we can see the difference by looking at what a good use case is it it um ensures that we know what the goal is so it would be tied to a user story but it also has events which trigger the use case um, and it calls out who it is that that um, is executing who's responsible for the different steps whether this be the system or the user as opposed to in a user story where the system is just assumed. A good use case um, ensures that we know what the preconditions are. So in other words, what the state of the system is before we bother to um, uh, get started in this executing this business process. And it has both the normal and alternative flows and the exceptions. Whereas in a user story, we really don't go to that level of detail. We just wanna keep it very high level and use the, the user stories as a good way to communicate with the stakeholders and the end users. And then finally, in a good use case, it has the, the post conditions or the, the state of the system at the, at the, uh, at the outset, or at the end of, the, of the, um, the, the process execution. Like I said, user stories are really built with the communications with the stakeholders in mind. And use cases are to be able to guide the system implementers and testers. As we close out, let's consider the main points. Namely, remember the question that we are trying to answer. That is, as a particular role, what do I want to do and what's the motivation behind it? Remember that stories can range in size, but they should eventually lead to manageable chunks that can be completed in short order. So be okay with having epics that span multiple stories and user stories that really relate down to um, a very quick implementation. And while there's no limit to the number of stories, if you find yourself repeating the stories, it might be a good sign that you haven't gone into enough detail describing the, the overlapping stories. And we may really have um, more than one story because the motivation differs or because the what I wanna do differs just a bit. And finally, user stories are expected to be continually added and refined as the project progresses, especially in an iterative approach. Stories help us to communicate progress with the stakeholders and with team members alike. And so as we're describing kind of our status along the way, we can share um, both analytically, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, as well as just um, sharing the stories themselves as updates to how far along we've come with a particular set of features. And just like other software development methodologies, if you apply user stories properly to your software project, you'll be able to produce a quality software system um, 
and win the trust and satisfaction of your customers. Here's a few points that you want to keep in mind when writing the user story. Keep it short. Think from the user's perspective. Confirm items before you start the development. Estimate them. Make sure we get the requirements from the end users, not just the development team. And remember that communication is really important and can help us to understand what the end user wants. Recognize that they may not know exactly what they want until after you've been through a few iterations of your project. This is why we need to keep updating our user stories.